In the beginning, there was darkness. An endless void of terrible comic book movies, each one more insipid and unremarkable than the last. But then the Lord said, let there be light. And there was light. It's hard to believe that 11 years have passed since Iron Man launched the Marvel Cinematic Universe and rewrote the book on bringing comics to the big screen. A lot has changed in that time. Both superheroes and video games are more mainstream than ever, and thanks to titles like Spider-Man PS4 and the Batman Arkham series, comic book games are finally getting the respect that they deserve. But today I want to travel back to a simpler time. A time when the only people who'd heard of Thanos and his Infinity Gauntlet were smelly sexless weirdos on the internet. Or comic book fans as they prefer to be called. A time when the Hulk was dumb, Thor was £100 lighter, and Spider-Man looked like this guy. A time when terrible movie tie-in games were the order of the day, and big dweebs like me ate that shit up, because it was all we had. With the exception of the Avengers, every single Phase 1 MCU movie had a tie-in game released, and I've played them all, so that you don't have to. Before we begin, it's worth mentioning that I'm only going to be talking about the home console versions of these games, otherwise Thor on the DS would probably wipe the floor with the lock. But with all that out of the way, hey everyone, Josh here from Panels Pixels, and this is every MCU video game ranked and reviewed. The good, the bad, and the ugh, Jesus Christ, why am I doing this? Ho oh, ho Thor, first you were hot in a weird Shakespearean way, then you were hot in a totally forgettable way, and then you were still hot but a lot funnier. 2011's Thor often gets a kicking from fans, but put aside the Dutch angles and weird blonde eyebrows, and it's kind of the best of the Thor trilogy. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. But dust it maketh a good video game? I say thee, nay. Aww. Like a lot of superhero titles from the PS3 and Xbox 360 generation, Thor God of Thunder is a third person character action game with puzzles, platforming, and big scary bosses. In other words, it's a God of War clone. Straight up, shave Thor's head, paint a red stripe down him, you've got a God of War game. The game's developers, Liquid Entertainment, were not exactly shy about wearing their hack and slash influences on their sleeves, and I actually talked about this game in a previous video on Marvel games that are total God of War ripoffs. Go check that one out, there are more than you'd think. In that video, I really only focus on how ugly the game is because, I mean, just look at it. But maybe there's more here than meets the eye. Beauty is only skin deep, after all. Maybe I just need to dive in, spend some time getting to know the gameplay, and soaking in the many sights and sounds that the Nine Realms have to offer. Six hours later. No, sorry, this game is dog poop. It looks like dog poop, it plays like dog poop, it even smells like dog poop. I tried to like this game, I really did, but it has so few redeeming features. Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston reprise their roles as Thor and Loki, and I'm sure they're giving it the old college try. It's just a shame you can't hear them over the horrendously bad sound design. Armstrong's your thing, brother. Can't you make us any easier on yourself? Some of the moves that Thor has at his disposal at least seem cool the first time you pull them off. Summoning lightning down upon your enemies and being able to toss your mighty Uru Hammer Mjolnir are neat tricks and all, but the combat is so repetitive and the hit detection is so broken that the novelty soon wears off. Add to that an enemy boss health bar that makes zero sense whatsoever. I genuinely had no idea if I was winning this fight or not until I pulled this guy out of the slightly bigger guy's chest. What is going on here? I didn't even know he was in there! On paper, the game ticks all the boxes for fans of the Odinson. You get to see Asgard, Jodenheim, Muspelheim, you bump into Heimdall, Mangog, and you even get to fight Surtur, who would later show up in Thor Ragnarok. But while the Thor comics and movies, with their bright and vibrant take on the Norse mythology, have always filled me with a sense of wonder and adventure, this game's environments are so uninspiring and dull. I don't want to explore this version of Asgard. Frankly, I don't want to be there at all. Thor God of Thunder is a particularly egregious example of a bad movie tying game. The gameplay is about as joyless as it gets, the story is mediocre at best. Oh, and did I mention it looks like absolute dog poop? You know, I had a hard time deciding whether Thor or the next game on the list should take the bottom spot. They both suck, and trying to choose which is better is a bit like trying to pick your favourite venereal disease. Anyway, I'm sick of looking at Thor's big melon head now, let's move on. Iron Man 2 is widely considered to be the MCU's first big misstep, and a lesson learned for Marvel Studios about not putting franchise building ahead of good storytelling. The movie failed to capture the same effortless fun and excitement of its predecessor, and to be honest, the same can be said of its tie-in game. Iron Man 2's plot is a continuation of the film with a story written by fan-favourite comic book writer and then Iron Man scribe Matt Fraction. 
To be fair, this is one area in which Iron Man 2 actually does improve on the original, with some cool non-chronological narrative framing and cutscenes that actually make sense. Considering how incoherent and devoid of context the first game's campaign was, this is a nice change of pace. The level design is much more restricted and linear, with lots of corridors and hallways to fight your way through, removing the aerial combat which was the highlight of the first game. One sequence in particular has you flying through the exhaust vent of an exploding reactor. It has the potential to be a really cool set piece, but the clunky flight controls turn it into an incredibly frustrating experience. Gameplay wise, you get so many different mechanics thrown at you right from the start of the game, and it can be a little overwhelming. The combat has been rebuilt from the ground up, adding melee abilities and a new lock-on targeting system. It's a lot to take in right from the offset, and I feel like a lot of these powers would have been better unlocked throughout the game with a more intuitive upgrade system. You do have the option to play as War Machine right from the beginning though, which is cool and adds some replayability to make up for the game's short length. Eric Loomis, who provides the voice of Tony Stark here, is better known for voicing the character in the Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. It's a possible performance, but he doesn't quite pull off the smirking snarkiness that Robert Downey Jr. brought to old Shellhead. The graphics somehow look worse than the first game, textures are flat and Iron Man's armour has lost its metallic lustre. Don't get me wrong, the original was no oil painting, but Iron Man 2 is a huge downgrade visually and actually looks more like a PS2 game. The game's soundtrack features music by contemporary metal bands of the time such as Lamb of God and Meshuggah. It's not really my kind of thing and it's drowned out by some inconsistent sound design, but I do think it's cool that it's in there. It takes me back to a time when a soundtrack full of obscure alternative bands could be used to market a video game. Not now, Maximum Carnage! All in all, it's hard to really critique this game without first talking about the original, which is ostensibly the better game. Ultimately, Iron Man 2 is a lesson in not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. The game's developers' secret level tried to course correct after the negative reception to the first title, and ended up scrapping a lot of the unique gameplay elements which made the first Iron Man at least mildly interesting. Hello, it's me, just dropping in quickly to say that this video is made possible, at least in part, by my awesome supporters over at patreon.com slash panels to pixels. For as little as $1 per month, you can get access to bonus videos, the Patreon-only Discord server, shoutouts and videos like this one, and much, much more. Huge shout out to Diego Rivera and Detective Pika for supporting the channel at the maximum carnage level. Uh, if you want to join them, then again, that's patreon.com slash panels to pixels. Okay, on with the show. Let's face it, movie tie-in games are notorious for being glitchy, unfinished, and generally low-rent attempts to capitalise on whatever the latest blockbuster is. There was E.T. for the Atari 2600, Street Fighter the movie The Game, and, uh, Charlie's Angels? Seriously? But for a lot of people, one game above all others epitomises the crappy movie tie-in genre. I'm talking about 2008's Iron Man for the Xbox 360 and PS3. But maybe, just maybe, this one is worth another look. Developed by Secret Level, this game follows the plot of the movie. Mmm, kind of. After a brief CG cutscene that doesn't really tell you anything at all, you would drop right into the action with pretty much zero context for what's going on. I think the game's writers were relying on the fact that you'd have seen the film before playing the game, but if you hadn't, well, good luck I guess. But who's here for the story anyway? Let's kick names and take ass. You've got to admit, this intro stage is pretty rad. Even more so in the PS2 version, which blasts out Black Sabbath's Iron Man while you're single-handedly winning the war on terror. I just love how visceral and merciless it all is. I think people get hung up on the idea that the likes of Batman, Superman and Spider-Man don't kill and assume that all superheroes live by the same code. Tony Stark straight up murders a bunch of people in his first movie and I respect that the game's designers didn't shy away from making Iron Man a walking, talking, killing machine. I have a feeling that if this game was made today, you'd be going up against drones and unmanned tanks instead. Unlike in the sequel, Robert Downey Jr. lends his unmistakable voice to the first game, but only for the Tony Stark stuff in the cutscenes. All the in-game Iron Man dialogue is handled by a sound alike voice actor, who does a fairly convincing job. We also get actor likenesses in the game which range from somewhere deep in the uncanny valley to, wow, what did Gwyneth Paltrow do to piss these developers off? And don't even get me started on Rhodey, he looks nothing like Don Cheadle. <laughs> for the most part though, the game's graphics are pretty solid for the time. The armoured Avenger himself looks suitably metallic and moves in a natural way. The enemy and stage designs can be kind of generic and uninspiring, but that was the style du jour of the mid to late 2000s, where every video game was either a grey shade of brown, or a brown shade of grey. While the rest of the MCU tie-in titles are beatable on any difficulty, if you play Iron Man on anything other than easy mode, you may be a psychopath. This game can be brutal at times, with wave after wave of enemies coming at you from every angle and raining down fire and fury upon your tiny little tin man body. And paradoxically, the fact that Iron Man is so heavily armed is offset by the endless amounts of bad dudes that keep spawning in, leaving the whole exercise feeling kind of meaningless. 
With so much happening on screen at any one time, you don't get a sense that your repulsor blasts and missiles are actually connecting with anything. And it's when there are too many on screen enemies and explosions that the cracks really start to appear in this low budget, underdeveloped title, with slowdown and screen tearing really taking you out of the experience. One thing I really love about superhero movie tie-in games is when the developers pull stuff from the original comics to further flesh out the universe with characters, storylines and references not found in the film. It's a good incentive for fans to play these games because it extends the canon of the movie and allows for details that might not be so easily translated into a mainstream blockbuster. A great example of this in Iron Man is the use of the Magia crime family, who you may recognise from Spider-Man PS4's DLC, or the likes of Titanium Man. One downside, however, is when the developers use a character like Whiplash, which contradicts his later inclusion in Iron Man 2, and it kind of screws with the idea of these games being canon to the movies. As I said earlier, there really isn't much in the way of a story here, and at just 4 hours and change, the main campaign is outrageously short, but it's the unique gameplay elements that really make Iron Man worth your time. Unlike most superhero games of the time, which modelled themselves on hack and slash titles like God of War or Devil May Cry, the developers of Iron Man took a much more airborne approach, which is exactly what you would expect from the Armoured Avenger. The flight controls can be a little fiddly at first, but once I got the hang of them I was zipping around each level with ease, and pulling off some very satisfying manoeuvres while dodging oncoming enemy fire. Do a barrel roll. So you fly around defeating waves of enemies with various weapons at your disposal. Some are better suited for taking down certain enemy types, and a relatively intuitive upgrade system allows you to tailor the experience to your style of play. One mechanic that I really love is the ability to allocate power to various suit functions. If you've seen any of the Iron Man movies, you'll no doubt be familiar with scenes like this. Jarvis, put everything we got into the thrusters. I just did. It's a really cool little wrinkle on an otherwise basic aerial combat system, and it makes all the difference in making you actually feel like Iron Man. Having to think on the fly and put extra juice into your armour systems to preserve health, or flipping over to your weapons to really bring the pain. It's incredibly satisfying and ends up being one of the more engaging elements of the game. In terms of the actual moment to moment gameplay, your objective is usually either take out a certain amount of enemies in a certain amount of time, destroy larger weapons and bosses, or the rather tedious escort missions where you must protect ally aircrafts. Each stage also has an optional hero objective, things like protecting soldiers or taking down US Air Force jets without injuring the pilots. It's a nice idea, but these challenges aren't always clearly defined, and usually more trouble than they're worth. Despite my completionist tendencies, I find myself ignoring the hero objectives for the sake of my sanity. Aside from the main campaign, there are also the one-man army stages, which task you with replaying the same stages from the story, but with larger waves of enemies and with a tighter time limit. Kind of a survival mode, I guess. Completing these challenges unlocks alternate suits, which is, you know, neat. So you're gonna do a superhero landing. Wait for it! Woo! Superhero landing! But all this is to say that it's not awful. I mean, it's pretty awful, but I genuinely had fun playing this game. Let's be real, it's far from the best game on this list, but if I'm being totally honest, it's the one I'm most eager to pick up and replay. Because at its best, Iron Man is a mindless arcadey shooter with a lot to offer for fans of the character. The game got dumped on pretty bad by critics when it first released, and I don't know if that was wholly deserved. Somewhere within the satisfying aerial combat, robust upgrade system, and at times surprisingly good graphics, there is a legitimately great game in here somewhere, and with a little more time in the development oven, Iron Man could have really shined. At the very least, I hope Camouflage are taking notes for their upcoming Iron Man VR. Two thousand and eight's The Incredible Hulk was like the cherry on top of Iron Man's ice cream sundae. Released only a month apart, the Hulk's first MCU outing was… just fine. But it was this post credit scene and the ramifications it would have on the wider universe that really got comic book fans excited. Oh, and I guess they made a game of it too. The Incredible Hulk, the video game, loosely follows the plot of the movie, but brings in characters and subplots from the comics to beef up the story. All the classics are here. Rick Jones, Bye Beast, the UFOs. Whew. The Hulk might just have the worst supporting cast in all of comics, right? This is a sandbox game which sets the player loose as the Hulk in a sprawling open world New York. Aside from the main story missions, there are tons of collectibles, famous landmarks to smash, and various side missions to complete. Sound familiar? Alright, let's talk about the giant green elephant in the room. This is a straight up reskin of a previous Hulk game, 2005's The Incredible Hulk Ultimate Destruction. 
Everything from the combat moves to the traversal system is just ripped straight from Ultimate Destruction, and given, to be honest, a graphical downgrade to look more like the movie. Radical Entertainment, the studio behind Ultimate Destruction, were busy developing their prototype series at the time, itself featuring an open world Manhattan and mechanics swiped from their Hulk game. So Sega instead handed the project off to a relatively unknown developer, Edge of Reality, whose most notable credits included the N64 ports of the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater games. The result is a game that's glitchy, repetitive, and not very nice to look at. The ultimate power fantasy of leaping from tall buildings and wreaking havoc in the streets of New York is somewhat neutered by constant texture popping, freezing, and dropped frame rates. It's a pretty exhausting experience. And speaking of being exhausted, Edward Norton gives by far the worst voice performance of any of his fellow Avengers. I don't know if this was just an easy paycheck for him, or if he was contractually obliged to do it, but he sounds like he'd rather be literally anywhere else in the world than in that sound booth recording dialogue for this crappy video game. I appreciate your help, Dr. Stearns, but I'm putting you at terrible risk. Do you think you can cure me? I really don't have much more to say about this one. The Incredible Hulk is definitely a better game than Iron Man on a technical level, even if I didn't have as much fun playing it. It secures the number two spot by default, because the rest of the games on this list are so goddamn awful. But this is not a good game by any stretch of the imagination, and you'd be much better off playing Hulk Ultimate Destruction. Hell, go play the 2003 Hulk movie game. Compared to this one, it is a masterpiece. Captain America Super Soldier marks the end of the collaboration between Marvel and Sega to bring the heroes of the MCU into the world of video games. Developed by Next Level Games, it represents a significant step up in quality over the other titles on this list, and is considered by many to be a hidden gem in the movie tie-in game genre. Super Soldier was released in 2011 alongside Captain America The First Avenger, which is itself a criminally underrated film, and one of my personal favourite comic book movies of all time. But rather than simply retelling the events of the film, this title can be considered an interquel chronicling the adventures of Steve Rogers during World War II. That is, after he dons the Star Spangled suit, but before his final confrontation with Red Skull. In other words, you know that badass montage in the movie where it's just Cap punching Hydra goons and jumping his motorcycle out of exploding buildings? Well, this is a whole game of that, and it kicks serious butt. Right off the bat, we get an opening cutscene that gives us more context and story than any of the other games on this list, and it's immediately apparent that more care went into this title's presentation. Gameplay-wise, Captain America Super Soldier borrows heavily from the Batman Arkham series of games, but that's not such a bad thing, and to be fair, this was one of the first superhero games to follow in the Dark Knight's footsteps. Even so, anybody who's familiar with the 1-2 punch counter combo based gameplay should have no problems here. But what I really enjoy about this title is the extra dimension that the shield adds to the combat. Being able to attack, block, and even throw Cap's mighty vibranium discus is insanely satisfying. And thanks to some truly excellent sound design, we finally know what it sounds like when Steve Rogers gives his enemies a jolly good wanking. Aside from the punching and deadly games of frisbee, the rest of the game pretty much revolves around quick time events and some Prince of Persia style acrobatics. Honestly though, the less said about these sections the better, as the combat is really the main draw here. So much so that Chris Evans actually used this game as the basis for the character's faster and more furious fighting style in The Winter Soldier. Speaking of Chris Evans, the actor reprises his role as the Star Spangled Man with a plan, and he actually does a great job. Being the world's most earnest man allows Evans to deliver some pretty ropey video game dialogue with absolute conviction, and I appreciate that he commits to this voice only role in a way that none of his fellow Avengers ever did in their respective tie-in games. Again, much like the Arkham series, there is a lot of exploration to be done here, with puzzles, collectibles, and easter eggs galore. In fact, there are literal ceramic eggs to collect, bloody hundreds of them, and let me tell you, Riddler trophies they are not because while the developers behind the Arkham series took the time to strategically place their collectibles in areas that require skill, puzzle solving and gadget upgrades to access, here the countless dossiers, film reels and assorted Nazi paraphernalia are just scattered around on desks and in the corners of every room. That's fine and all, but if you're like me and any type of in-game collectible drives your stupid monkey brain into a state of obsessive compulsive anxiety, you will find yourself devoting 5 minutes every time you enter a room to run around mopping up useless crap. I mean, what am I, Red Skull's maid? I have to admit, it kinda kills the flow of the action, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna leave a single page of Baron Zemo's diary unturned. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Zemo's in this game, but like, actual purple tube sock over his face Zemo, as opposed to the depressed slam poet Zemo that we got in Civil War. Visually, the game is just okay. A lot of indeterminate grey mush posing as scenery and jerky camera movements really let down an otherwise fantastic game. The art direction and overall character design takes its cues from the movie, but the game's design is really run with the whole pulpy sci-fi Nazi vibe, with lots of 1940s mechs and laser guns. For that reason, it reminds me a lot of the Wolfenstein series, and I am all about it. 
With just a little more polish, this Captain America game could have been up there with the likes of Arkham City, which came out the same year. Sadly, not even this title was immune from the effects of bad movie tie-in syndrome, and the lack of time and resources afforded to next level is very apparent in the game's overall quality. Still, I think it's a real shame that this was the last of the MCU games, because it's clear that Captain America Super Soldier was a giant leap in the right direction. With Avengers coming out the following year, who knows what kind of games we might have seen if the partnership between Marvel and Sega had continued. And just like that, it was over. There was a first person Avengers game in the works from THQ, which, although based on the comics, was set to release alongside the movie. Sadly, the game was cancelled due to financial reasons. In the years that followed, players wised up to the overall low quality of licensed movie games and stopped buying them. The film studios, meanwhile, realised that releasing terrible tie-in games probably does more harm than good in promoting their latest blockbusters. With the rise of mobile gaming, movie tie-ins migrated to a platform that required less development time and could be more easily monetized. Iron Man 3, Thor The Dark World and Captain America Winter Soldier all had mobile games that are now no longer available for download. I know I'm probably in the minority here, but I really miss the days of movie games, especially those based on superhero titles. Sure there was a lot of crap, but every now and then you found a diamond in the rough. Some of my favourite games ever are movie games that turned out way better than they had any right to be. If I have to push through the dumpster fire that is Thor God of Thunder to get to Captain America Super Soldier, then so be it. I'm like this all day. Alright, well I, I guess that's it. No need to stick around until after the credits. It's not like there were any other video games based on the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Okay, I'm off to get some shawarma. Bye then. Ah, another video finished. Time to go to bed. You think those are the only MCU games in the world? Josh, you've become part of a bigger universe. You just don't know it yet. Who are you and what are you doing in my room? I'm the original Nick Fury. I know I'm not so popular these days, but damn it. I was here first, and I deserve some recognition. I'm here to talk to you about LEGO Marvel's Avengers. <laughs>